Mina, Kondan Wa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. Yeah, I got in a fight with a weed whacker and lost it. Ah, I felt so good to lose all that hair too. It's like, it's it's so clean, it's so smooth, it's so shiny, and there are no responsibilities in taking care of my hair anymore. Although I feel like to some small degree I lost just a little bit of sexiness. Anyway, none of that has to do with Jesus or the Bible. Second Kings, chapter 6. This is a story of the man who never was. Well, obviously he exists or he wouldn't be in here. But the story shouldn't have ended where it was. Anyway, and it's, it's kind of something indirect that I just kind of thought about as I was reading. Let's start with mm, verse 14. So we've got a king, the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, and he is trying to fight against Israel. And Elisha is helping out the king of Israel by like basically saying, yeah, this king's going here, this king's going there. No, Elisha didn't have a spy nowhere going on. The Lord would simply tell him, this is where the king of Syria is going. Now he's over here. Now he's over here. And he passed that information along to the king of Israel. And so the king of Syria is like, okay, who's the spy here? And they're like, uh, no spies, just this prophet over here who knows everything you're doing and saying. So he's like, well, let's get rid of the prophet. So he sends a bunch of troops over there. And that's in verse 14, so let's just pick up there. Therefore he, that's Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, most preachers love to take that one verse right there in this little section here and like, you know, look at the angelic army surrounding them. Look at the protection that God's people have. And that is absolutely true. Totally agree with that. But the point that I saw was the young man. The young man who was with Elisha. Now, this young man is named. He was named in the chapter before this, chapter 5, and the chapter after. Well, I'm sorry, two chapters after. My apologies, in chapter 8. And the guy's name is Gehazi. Now, what happened, you know, Elisha was the servant of Elijah, and he got, he picked up Elijah's mantle. He asked for a double portion. Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing, but if you stay with me to the end, you will have it. What happened with Gehazi? You go back a chapter, and you see how greed took a hold of him when Naaman was healed, and Elisha said, no, I'm not taking any of your gifts. Gehazi was like, I'm getting some of them gifts. He goes out after Gehazi, makes up a story about two young sons of the prophets coming to stay with Elisha, and makes up Naaman's like, yeah, take some stuff, take some stuff. So he grabs his stuff, he locks it away. Elisha's like, where are you going? Gehazi's like, I didn't go anywhere. Or said, where, where did you go? And he says, I didn't go anywhere. And he was like, is this really a time to get stuff? Now Naaman's leprosy is going to be passed on to you. So what happened to him? He was named, and he faded away into obscurity and into nothing. And his legacy is one of, he's, I'm assuming he stayed, well no, I don't have to assume he did stay Elisha's sermon, because in chapter 8 it still talks about Gehazi. Gehazi's still there, and from what I can tell, 2 Kings, at least this part of it, is written in chronological order. Um, as a historical book, it's not like, you know, where in, in the place of history is this, how did this go? This was going along in chronological order. So, Gehazi was Elisha's servant before the sin and after the sin. So, even as a leper and even post-sin, he served Elisha. He didn't leave his side. I will not say he committed that sin of greed, the, um, the, the punishment of leprosy was on him and his descendants forever. Of course, he couldn't inherit Elisha's anointing. Look at how, his, how he sinned. Rather, apparently he did not fully recover from that sin. He didn't, he didn't rise up. I'm assuming he repented of the sin, otherwise he wouldn't have continued, continued to serve Elisha, but he didn't rise up and say, you know what, I'm going to stand up in the middle of my punishment. Um, did he ask God for a second chance? I don't know. Maybe he did his absolute best afterwards, and maybe the punishment for the sin did continue on. 
and he simply couldn't rise up like Elisha did. Elisha rose up, got a double portion. Gehazi fell into greed, became a leper, and that was the end of it. But my thought is, he could have risen above that. God's a forgiving God. He's a merciful God. If he had sought God and desired that relationship with God and desired God's anointing and power, God's the kind of God who's in the forgiving business. He's the kind of God who would say, all right, let's pick you up. Let's keep on going. Since nothing else is mentioned, and of course no great prophets after Elisha really are mentioned, not in, at the, that level of power, some great prophecies, some great visions in the forms of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, absolutely some great and outstanding things happen, but nothing on the power level of Elijah and Elisha. And Gehazi dropped the ball, in my opinion is, and... I leave a comment down below saying how I'm, you agree with me or how I'm wrong. He dropped the ball. He could have not only repented and said, I'm sorry, and continued serving Elisha, he could have repented and said, I'm going to get past this. I'm going to pursue this. Even if I stay a leper, I'm going to serve the Lord. Even if I, this punishment stands on me and my descendants, I want to serve God the best I can from here on out. And he, and God would have done that. God honors repentance. God forgave Abraham for Ishmael. He forgave David for adultery and murder. He forgave Elijah for running away from Jezebel. God's in the forgiving business. If you want him, you get him. And instead he becomes that young man in one chapter. And the leper in the previous chapter. And the guy who's... I, I read ahead a little bit. He becomes the guy who reminisces and talks about how great his master is in the next. And it's just... There was so much potential for more. He was chosen as Elisha's servant, just as he was chosen as Elijah's. And there was so much potential, and God's a forgiving God. Let me know in the comments down below what you think. I see a lot of lost potential. I don't see, like, here's the ban hammer of leprosy and punishment for your greed, and that's the end. No, I see a lost opportunity of genuine repentance. It's like, he settled as the servant. He settled for mediocrity. He didn't try to pick up the mantle of Elisha as Elisha picked up the mantle of Elijah. So let me know what you think in the comments below. I love you and God bless.